All right. Howdy, AP World History students. This lecture is going to focus on topic 6.2 on the growth of imperial states during 1750 to 1900, right? So state expansion, global and economic development, and sort of economic imperialism will be a part of this lecture, as well as exploring some of the indigenous responses to state expansion in that time period. Um, now, people still debate the relative damage and merits of imperialism in Africa, in Asia, and in some of the other parts of the world we're going to be looking at. And there are good, convincing arguments on both sides about whether imperialism was a good thing or a bad thing. Economic points could be made that make imperialism sound like a complete disaster for the colonized or the colonizers. There's arguments based around political or cultural developments that imply that it worked out for better or for worse. Socially, though, I think it's important to remember that the USA is among the very first countries of the modern era to resist policies of British imperialism, for example, with revolutionary violence. And this was without any of the racist, social Darwinist perspectives that added insult to injury in European imperialism in Africa, just good old enlightenment ideals of natural rights and the dignity of man. Now, it wouldn't be long until the USA was also engaged in empire building and making their own justifications for the atrocities they committed, but before that, we shared a connection with any that would resist empire. And that's what we want to try and explore a little bit in this lecture here today. So since our focus on this lecture is Africa, there's a couple maps here that I like to show that help to show um, sort of the scale of Africa and really place it in context. Maps like this that show the ethnic and linguistic variation that you can find throughout Africa. Again, this is another one showing sort of ethno-linguistic groups but then maps like this, right, from The Economist, that really put the scale of Africa into context as well. Many of the European countries that we're going to be looking at that would be involved in colonizing Africa were ruling African territories several orders of magnitude larger than their own native lands in Europe, or several times larger than Europe as a continent, for, for that matter. You can see all the kinds of gigantic countries and regions that you can fit in Africa on a map like this. Additionally, it's important to understand the growth of European political and economic control of the world um, is not a change in period six, but is a continuity from period four, right? Going back to the early 15th century, Portugal under Henry the Navigator and guys like that had begun and was followed by other European powers to um, explore the coast of Africa during the Age of Exploration, or period four, to establish trading post empires in places like the Congo or the, the um, Swahili states of the east coast of Africa, to engage in and increase the slave trade. By the mid 19th century, the 1800s, European control of Africa remained confined mostly to coastal areas for technological, medical, and economic reasons we're gonna explore in a moment here. The Industrial Revolution led to far greater exploration and colonization. This time though, the major players would not be Spain and Portugal as they'd been in the 14 and 1500s, whose empires were at this time in a state of decline, instead, Countries like Britain and France, who were classic European powers and it had been involved in, you know, earlier era of colonization as well, but also new countries like Italy and Germany, who were brand new at this time, as well as others like Belgium and the Dutch would play the major parts of this global scramble for territory, markets, and resources. Sorry, I had a couple of maps on there. Um, a comparison of Africa before the scramble for Africa by European states at the end of the 19th century and a map of Africa's colonial empires on the eve of World War I, on the right-hand side here, 
helps to show some of the changes we're trying to explore in this lecture. All right. While you can see on the left that there are some European colonies already present in the 19th century and earlier in South Africa and the central areas of East and West Coast of the East and West Coast of Africa, these were small trading post style colonies that with the exception of the Cape Colony in South Africa, were confined to the coast and did not extend very far into Africa's interior. They were trading post forts, right? Prior to the conquest of Africa, it's important to also note that a lot of the areas that would come under Europeans' control were not under the control of what Europeans traditionally described as you know, states or kingdoms or empires, but were instead what our textbook, what Strayer describes as stateless societies, right? With very little formal administration and any governing being done at a, at a very local level. For the most part, a lot of the gray areas in the 1880 map can be described like that as, as stateless societies. But you can see that even more importantly, um, and signif that significant amounts of conquered Africa were previously controlled by what Europeans did traditionally consider and define as states and kingdoms and empires. And they referred to them as such when they first encountered them in, or encountered them in a, in a major way in the 14 and 1500s when they established those trading posts. In a lot of cases, Europeans had been in contact and had been maintaining trade and diplomatic relationships with those states for several centuries, if not longer. And your textbook does a good job of discussing how those points of view kind of shift over time, right? With sort of looking at these people as somewhat as, as equals and being impressed by their cities and kingdoms to referring to them as tribes and as subhuman and, and all of that sort of racial ideology coming into play by the 18th, 19th centuries. So for example, North Africa and the Ottoman Empire had obviously been in prolonged contact with Europeans. Um, by 1882, though, it's going to lose a lot of that territory that you see in North Africa to native uprisings that were encouraged by the British and French kind of mingling and uh, meddling in that empire. West Africa is filled with states that we've read about or talked about before, like the Sokoto Caliphate, the Kingdom of Ashanti, the Kingdoms of Dahomey or um, Benin, a bunch of them that, that you might recognize if you kind of examine it there, as well as many smaller, wealthy coastal states that had both been afflicted by and profited from the slave, gold, and ivory trade over the previous centuries. East, Afri East Africa's coast in 1880 was still controlled by powerful Swahili-speaking sultans and city-states, although significantly weakened a lot by the Portuguese raids two centuries earlier. Europeans of the 19th and 20th centuries often justified their incursions into Africa by describing its emptiness and relative unuse by the locals. Europeans would make the same observations and justifications centuries earlier earlier during the conquest of the Americas, right? Hey, well, there's nobody here, so we built a house on it, right? Considering the validity, consider, you know, how valid this argument would be if people tried to use it to justify building a home or fortress in your backyard in whatever section you didn't currently have something built on, right? Um, it probably wouldn't be care very convincing to you and your family that it's fine for these people to live here because hey, you, you weren't using this part of your backyard, right? There's no house here, there's no fort here, right? So it's up for grabs, right? But that's gonna be the claim uh, you know, throughout a lot of this conquest. On the right-hand side, you see the end result of European colonization in Africa, where literally every single piece of Africa that could be taken was taken. The one exception here being um, Ethiopia, which we've discussed um, and you've read is one of, is the only place really in Africa that resists imperial domination, all right, successfully through military conflict. So what changed? Why does this conquest of Africa and other parts of the world start up again 
in the 18th and 19th centuries? Why weren't these places conquered in the 1400s, the 1500s, 1600s, when Europeans were first exploring and gaining access to some of these areas? Well, a few things, okay? A few things can help kind of make sense of this. The first being the Maxim gun, all right? The maximum gun is sort of the first legit machine gun that is being produced on a large scale, right? The first production machine gun, really, developed in 1884 by an American, Hiram Maxim, a British American. I think he's a Sir Hiram Maxim. I think he gets knighted for creating such a terrifying weapon. Um, this was a a real machine gun. It could fire 11 rounds a second. It could shoot five or 600 rounds a minute. Um, it was cooled by water, which, you know, if you had a steady supply of water, let you just blast away with this thing. And these weapons widened an already respectable gap in military technology between Europeans and many of the groups they were going to face in Africa and other parts of the world as they tried to conquer those parts. This allowed outnumbered European forces to gain a large advantage in colonial conflicts of conquest. A famous saying from a children's book at the time went, whatever happens, we've got the Maxim gun and they have not. So the introduction of technologies like this, machine guns, breech loading rifles, right? Which basically just means, you know, you're, you're slotting the bullets in there and, you know, loading those guns that way instead of the old, you know, gunpowder and shot and all that stuff stuffed down the barrel. You have these much more effective, much faster firing weapons and rifles that let fewer men provide the fire firepower of a much larger group of people, right? Another change or development that allows for colonization to ramp up once again is the development of um, medicines like, like uh, quinine, all right? Malaria and other tropical diseases had long hindered European exploration of the interior of Africa for centuries, okay? Um, malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes and um, there are some kinds of natural resistance that parts of the world have developed to malaria, right? The sickle cell disorder, sickle cell anemia, offers a kind of natural resistance to malaria. It sucks to have sickle cell um, a lot and can be deadly on its own, but if you happen to be in an area with a lot of malaria, it is also a kind of form of natural resistance. So you can see in the maps um, below, the strong correlation between the frequency of malaria in a region and the frequency of the sickle cell disorder. This is a great example of kind of Darwin's ideas of natural selection at work. Those with the sickle cell disorder are more likely to survive having malaria and therefore more likely to reproduce and have more kids and so on. Those without the disorder are more likely to die from malaria and not reproduce. So in these areas that have had to deal with it for a long time, nature is sort of selecting for the, in this case, advantageous trait of sickle cell anemia so that it has become a lot more prevalent in those areas over time, right? As this source of natural resistance. Aside from malaria resistance though, there aren't a lot of other good things about having sickle cell. And uh, you know, if you're not in that spot, then it's, then it's a terrible affliction. If you are in those spots, it's a terrible affliction until you get malaria where it might be a little useful. The big thing here is that Europeans generally lacked this resistance, right? There's parts of Italy, parts of the Mediterranean where you find um, some frequency of this, but nothing on the scale like you found in Africa. And so it wasn't until the 17th and 19th centuries when Europeans had invented or sort of discovered quinine or quinine that they were able to pursue the interior, all right? Quinine, you actually read about in a previous chapter earlier and some of the crash course videos talk about them, was used as a muscle relaxant by the Quechua in South America, people indigenous to Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador. Jesuit missionaries um, working with these Native Americans sent this plant back to Europe 
where eventually they found it could treat and prevent malaria in the 1600s. I think it's first used to treat malaria in the 16, 1631 in Rome. And with that new drug, expeditions to the interior of Africa could stay out longer and survive the diseases that had killed so many um, in centuries before. All right. That being said, uh, disease remains a major obstacle for adventurers and, you know, tourists and stuff like that to the interior of Africa to this day, right? Even with better malaria medicines and so on. All right, so all that being said, European imperialism in Africa was driven by a variety of economic, political, and social factors that changed frequently over the decades. Africa provided room, for example, for settler colonies to relieve pressure on the ever-growing populations of newly industrialized European countries. Now, how popular these colonies were as destinations for migrants is another matter altogether. A lot of times there weren't all that many Europeans moving into some of these places, but places like Algeria and Tunisia in North Africa became settler colonies for the French, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe in the southern parts of Africa were colonized by the British and Germans, um, Angola in the west by people like the Portuguese, by the Belgians, and Kenya in the east by the British as well, all came to host small numbers of European settlers. Industrialization provided another motivation for conquest as well, the one that kind of sticks with us the most in our heads nowadays. Europeans made exclusive claims to the use of certain waterways and monopolized the use of certain trade routes and resource areas. They staked claims on gold mines and diamond mines, on forests of rubber vines and palm oil trees, on deserts of salt flats and crude oil. All of these resources were essential as industrial or luxury goods and highly valued in home territories where they couldn't be found, right? Not a lot of rubber trees growing in Scotland or France or something like that. Um, these European countries went to other parts of the world where they could be found, grown and stolen or harvested, right? Or have that land turned into your country so that you have those resources now. Many of the political cartoons from this time express this desperate competitiveness, competitiveness for ever more control and the wealth and glory thought to come along with it. One of the great politicians of the age, Otto von Bismarck, who helped to forge the new state of Germany or the German Empire, which on the day the treaties were signed that brought Germany into being, sort of instantly made it one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful industrial state in Europe, um, Bismarck used his diplomatic clout to try and prevent what he feared would be the outbreak of war in Europe or elsewhere between European countries over imperial competition in Africa and abroad. Um, Bismarck hoped to maintain a kind of stable Europe and prevent conflict that might threaten the Germans newly won empire. So in kind of a time period between November 1884 and February 1885, Bismarck and German leadership organizes and hosts what's known as the Berlin Conference. Um, a meeting of the major powers of Europe to establish rules for their ongoing claims in Africa, all right? The result of this conference was known as the Act of Berlin, a kind of like set of agreements that these European countries would follow as they laid claim to all of Africa, basically, right? Except for Ethiopia. So these were the rules that they promised they would follow in the Act of Berlin, right? Um, that you had to notify other European powers of your claims in order for them to be valid. Hey. We want this part of Africa, um, it's gonna be ours. And that's what a lot of people were talking about sort of at this Berlin conference. We want this, you can get that, so that we don't have to fight about it later. Territory needs to be occupied by representatives, soldiers for the most part, or you know, company people from your country for the claim to be valid. You can't just say, we want uh, Kenya, so it's ours. You gotta build a base there or send uh, some 
company explorers or soldiers or something there for the claim to be valid. Um, they agreed to end slavery in Africa so they could say, hey, we're here to do a good thing. We're going to abolish slavery once and for all <laughs> in Africa. I was glad that they decided to do that. Um, they were going to call for free trade in Africa, right? That no one country was going to sort of be able to dominate or trade exclusively with one place, but that trade was going to be sort of open between all these colonial holdings to other parts of the world. Um, because the end goal was to sort of strip these areas of resources, really, really. Um, certain trade routes, the Niger and Congo rivers, for example, would be open to all for shipping, even if you didn't own the colony that kind of surrounded those spots, and a few other things, right? But these changes um, are what begins to be known as the scramble for Africa, right? That after agreeing to the Act of Berlin and concluding the Berlin Conference, it was a mad dash to claim all the lands in Africa. And so these countries don't end up with exactly what they discussed getting at the Berlin Conference. They get territories that look a lot different. Um, but it's at that conference where you kind of get this, you know, I always say it's like a real world kind of conspiracy meeting, right? You've got these great powers, these leaders from one part of the world organizing how to conquer this continent without any African delegates being present at this meeting as their lands are divided like slices of a pie. So during and after the conference, agents of various European states and corporations and soldiers began flooding into Africa to begin to sign treaties of protection, as they were called, with local rulers. Um, many of these rulers were often illiterate, um, with no written language used by their people at all, certainly no ability to understand legal documents written in European languages. These treaties were often deceptively described to local rulers who ignorantly signed the documents, surrendering local control of territory, resources, and political power to Europeans. One such example you can see on the right-hand side here Africans often thought they were signing declarations of friendship or alliance and were willing to, you know, under those terms. But the discovery of these disagreements would lead to resistance from African states once they realized they'd been misled and what exactly they had kind of signed away in these pretty shady treaties. Merchants, though, believing these treaties had created a sort of giant free trade zone in Africa, worked to cut out all the traditional African middlemen that had played a role in trade and now decided to try and go right to the source of raw materials themselves as representatives of the Royal Niger Company or the De Beers Company or you know one of these various companies that were gonna profit immensely from exploiting African resources and raw materials. When African res Africans resisted these incursions, European militaries would be called in to protect or avenge the interests of whatever corporation or missionary group claimed to be threatened. This was one of the ways states could justify sending military power to Africa and outright conquering big chunks of territory to enforce the treaties and protect their legal interests in the area, right? We were law-abiding, it's these Africans that signed this treaty and then tried to double-cross us, right, um, where the situation was in reality a lot different. And so resistance. Resistance in Africa was frequent, enduring, and constant. While many Africans willingly collaborated with European colonizers, many others actively resisted with violence. This violence often took two distinct forms, guerrilla warfare and sort of direct military engagements of army versus army. Guerrilla warfare um, is often described as consisting of kind of like hit and run tactics, sabotage and propaganda, and a general form of warfare that avoids large scale direct confrontation of army versus army, and instead attempts to make enemy occupation of territory as expensive 
and politically unpopular as possible. To elicit frustration from the conventional soldiers they fight and take political advantage of the use of stronger military force by the occupiers to put down the guerrillas. In the modern day, groups like the Taliban in Afghanistan during the 1980s um, or between you know, the first chunk of the 21st century against the USA or communist rebels in Cuba during the 1950s are all great examples of guerrilla fighting, guerrillas fighting conventional militaries successfully, all right? So you get a lot of guerrilla warfare, small scale, hit and run kind of conflict taking place throughout Africa where French or British soldiers might do some extreme thing in retaliation out of frustration and bloodlust or whatever, and then that would make them look worse and more unpopular to the locals and drive everybody further away, right? Guerrilla warfare has been used effectively by weaker forces to fight stronger forces. African examples include the Igbo people of, Mod of Igbo land in modern Nigeria. Igbo land was conquered initially in a rapid sort of three years time, but the Igbo continued to fight through guerrilla tactics for an extended period, making it expensive and difficult for Britain to secure control over the area, which they eventually do, but at a high cost. African states also resisted through outright military confrontation of army versus army. This was a lot less common, however, African armies generally lacked the most modern equipment. While guns were not uncommon in some African armies, they'd been traded, you know, trading heavily for guns during the slave trade and before, the new, sort of in the 19th century, machine guns and artillery used by European armies were exceedingly rare and mostly kind of non-existent in Africa. This is primarily why many of the colonized people resisted mostly via sort of guerrilla warfare means. It's the way favored by a less trained, less well-equipped army. Although there are many examples, two of the sort of most well-known examples of direct military resistance can be found in the example of Ethiopia, um, the Zulu, and the uh, Mandinka, or Mandinga. I, I mean, I guess so that's three examples. The Zulu Kingdom, which if you get a chance to sort of click on the link there, we'll, we'll take you to a little video about this uh, in particular. The Zulu Kingdom was near South Africa in what is what was known as Zululand. The Zulu had several engagements with Dutch settlers who had been pushed out of the British, who had been pushed out after the British annexed the Dutch South African colony of Cape Town. The Dutch won most of these engagements due to their superior firepower, and tension grew between the three powers of the Boers, or the Dutch settlers, the British settlers, and the Zulu. Um, after the British had conquered all the various Dutch territories from the Boers, or the Dutch, they came into conflict with the Zulu as well, the native sort of African inhabitants of the area. After losing the first engagement, at the Battle of Ishandwana um, in 1879, due to superior tactics and numbers, not weapons, of the Zulu, the British would invade Zululand with a much larger army and then defeat the Zulu. But they lost their first engagement with them. In the case of Ethiopia, and that was, you know, army versus army. In the case of Ethiopia, the ruler, Menelik II, had been supported by Italians hoping to get his approval for Italian colonial claims in Ethiopia, right? Italy kind of supports the rise of this emperor. But Menelik would end up denying the Italians' claims, right? Sort of uh, double-crossing them a little bit, although he, you know, he is like, I, I'm, I was never intending to give you any of my land. Um, but he'd end up sort of denying the Italians' claims. And in the meantime, he had learned from Orthodox Christian supporters the means of making modern European weaponry and began to arm a modern army in Ethiopia with machine guns, with artillery, as well as the large supply of rifles that they already had. When the Italians eventually tried to invade and press their claims, they discovered that they'd been tricked by Menelik II into thinking the Ethiopians were primitive or kind of lacked the modern weapons that would let them compete um, the organization of their military was behind and so on, 
only to be soundly defeated by an Ethiopian army that was both better armed and better led than the military force that the Italians brought to the fight. The Ethiopians would successfully outmaneuver the Italians with superior generals and also outgun them, delivering a defeat to the Italians at the Battle of Adwa, a famous battle that takes place in 1896. Again, you can click the link there to get a little um, uh, more specific description of that conflict. Um, but this would end the hopes of Italian conquest of Ethiopia for the rest of the century. World War II, though, would see the return of the Italy um, and a successful invasion for a period of time. Um, finally, Samore Ture was the founder of the Mandinka, sometimes you'll hear Mandingo, empire in Northwest Africa. And he, in building his own African empire, encountered the French doing the very same thing in West Africa, starting to carve out their own empire. Um, which is an interesting, kind of almost ironic situation on its own, right? These two empire builders conflicting. One of these guys we see of like, as like native resistance, although he's kind of conquering people that would have said he was a foreigner, you know, as much as the French were. Um, Touré was able to engage in diplomacy with France's rival, Britain, who was not willing to go to war with France at the time, but did allow the Mandinka to buy large amounts of modern repeating rifles um, from their ports in Sierra Leone. And with those weapons and a, and a newly sort of well-organized army, Samori Touré delivered several defeats in direct army versus army battle with the French. Um, now, he was unable to resist the might of France's industry, right? Like all of the factories and stuff like that behind the French army that made up for those losses quickly um, and their ability to kind of resupply and, and um, you know, refresh these, these colonial armies. So after 16 years of resistance that ranged from direct battlefield engagement to eventually him having to turn to guerrilla warfare and kind of scorched earth tactics, Samori Touré was eventually defeated, captured, and exiled. But these are all great examples that at no point is there a lack of African resistance, right? That Africans, you know, agreed to any of this conquest or signed treaties, you know, like Europeans would say, when they signed things, they were often tricked. And in every situation where they could, there was violent resistance put forth, right? Although there are a lot of examples of cooperation as well of one group versus another, because, you know, it was the case that not a lot of these people saw themselves as African, right? But as the various local groups that made up Africa. This is a picture of Samora Toure there, the great rebel leader in North and West Africa. So after these military successes, Europeans quickly assumed the role of governing the areas they had conquered and creating the necessary administrations and infrastructures to do so effectively. Um, historians describe the forms of colonial rule as falling into the categories of either indirect rule or direct rule. Indirect rule, um, the British followed this policy, for example, of indirect rule in much of Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria. Um, indirect rule kept native political elites in power and or formed an alliance with a dominant or sometimes a minority ethnic group to help the British rule in the region or the French or, or you know, whoever pursued this policy. This approach came to be known as divide and conquer or divide and rule, right? Picking, you know, there's two groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis or something, and you side up with the Tutsis or something, right? And uh, you make friends with them and help them sort of subjugate the other group, right? So you've got one of these groups on your side by treating them a little bit better, and they're helping you control this other group, and you've sort of elevated them above them, right? Divide and conquer, divide and rule. Indirect rule, um, but so in that case, you know, indirect rule is kind of interfering less with local traditions and customs, has a lot cheaper sort of administrative cost because 
you know, the colonizers taking this approach were basically taxing colonies to govern themselves and serve in their own armies. Um, remember what they used to say about no taxation without representation? Doesn't really apply in these cases, I guess. In the long run, indirect rule led to later class and tribal tension in the post-colonial era between the ethnic groups and individuals that collaborated with the colonizers and those that always maintained some kind of resistance. That example I gave of the Hutu and the Tutsi in Rwanda can be traced back to, you know, Germans siding with one group over the other, right? And sort of elevating it one group over the other um, to a position of control. And when those that area was decolonized, those tensions came back to the surface, one among you know, many sort of local problems. Another form of indirect rule involved the use of private companies or business interests, um, the diamond or gold miners, the oil companies, rubber companies, tea companies, slave trade companies, etc. cetera. Um, so in this case, not the British or Dutch or French governments directly, but corporate interests. Um, from those countries, carving out and ruling empires to extract resources indirectly, right? Governing on behalf of the British Empire or wherever. Um, so in that case, the colony served as a market for industrial or consumer goods being sold by that company and as a source of raw materials, right? To produce more of that stuff back home. The other approach was known as direct rule and was frequently used by the French in colonies like Algeria, but by the British, you know, as well as all the other groups as well. Um, direct rule saw European elites as administrators of a much more centralized colonial government, all right? In this case, most of the policy and directives for the colony were coming straight from the central government of France or Britain or wherever, not being decided on the ground by the local elites there, right? But somebody in London was deciding what was going to happen in you know, Kenya or, you know, wherever, wherever direct rule was sort of being practiced. However, direct rule also saw a lot of native political elites as the ones in power as well, especially at the lower levels of government, all right? Just like an indirect rule. So with some exceptions, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand in particular, Europeans existed in relatively few numbers in their colonies. So the majority of both direct and indirect systems administrators came from the local population, just as a reality of, you know, you've only got a couple hundred or thousand people in this whole area anyway. The major difference between the two systems, um, besides sort of, you know, one is sort of being ruled from the mother country, the other is sort of taking place a little bit more local. The major difference was in the expectation for the locals, all right? Um, when historians use the term direct rule, they often mean to imply that the locals were expected to kind of adapt and adopt European customs. France, for example, is often described as the country that made more frequent use of direct rule. And France promised its colonies they could earn citizenship as a Frenchman if they met certain requirements of assimilation. Um, these requirements were generally impossible tasks, though, um, for the vast majority of people to meet. Speaking French, for example, um, even though there weren't really enough schools in the colonies to teach it, um, you must have received an award for service to the French government but there were relatively few ways to serve for most of the population, right? Um, at the end of the day, this was more a political ideology than a, than a legitimate goal, right? But France liked to act like, you know, their goal was to turn all these people into one big French empire, right? And have a whole bunch of French citizens all over. They just had to be educated a little bit better, right? We're just trying to help them out. The economic situation in African colonies can be seen as both an economic disaster and a dramatic economic improvement, depending on the perspective or point of view that's being used, all right? As an economic disaster, we have the examples of um, native and local industries being forced into competition with industrial powers, all right? So for example, the handcrafted goods from local kind of cottage industries throughout Africa, or for that matter, in places like India and stuff as well, could not or cannot 
compete economically with mass produced goods produced in a Western factory in France or Britain or Germany somewhere. When these cheaper foreign goods were imported into colonies in Africa or in India, they put many local producers and artisans out of work, right? Why buy your expensive handmade cotton when I can get the cotton from British textile factories at half the price? So blacksmiths and leather tanners, for example, all over Africa disappeared. And many of those craftsmen and professionals were pushed into lower skill, lower wage professions and jobs, similar to what had happened during industrialization in Britain or, you know, in America and France and stuff around this same time. Um, another change that would be on the side of economic disaster is that subsistence farmers were encouraged by their colonial masters or threatened or forced to grow more cash crops or and or crops for export. Now, this actually made some local farmers wealthy, um, growing more crops and cash crops for export. Um, but as more land uh, was devoted to crops like tea, coffee, palm for, for palm oil, cotton, etc., less land was used for foodstuffs. The food that was being grown was also increasingly used commercially and exported to the mother country. Policies like this would lead to famine whenever hard times like drought, floods, or locusts, or warfare, or things like that would hit. The increased use of statute labor or corvi labor, coerced labor, slavery, right? All of these um, were on the economic disaster side. So most colonizers extracted some form of coerced labor from the colonized. The French, for example, required between 10 and 12 days a year from the colonized to work on public or corporate projects, building roads, railways, working in mines, etc. Um, this rarely involved well-paid treatment and in some cases led to workers being worked to death, killed for desertion, beaten or chained together like slaves, which they basically were. Even with good treatment, the work done was work that local farmers weren't doing on their own farms or businesses, but for the good of a foreign country and foreign company. So people gave up their time to enrich their colonizers. The Atlantic revolutions were fought over some of these very same issues between colony and colonizers, right? Creole versus Peninsulare and things like that. You got a similar kind of situation here with no sense of irony or, or anything on the part of the colonizers in this case. Finally, resources. The resources extracted from Africa were extracted by foreign companies using local, underpaid, or forced labor. Those goods and resources went to European industrial centers and factories, and not necessarily to be reinvested in the local area. Some of the resources like oil, gold, diamonds, were non-renewable, and the potential profits lost to the region forever, right? Once some country has come in and dug up all the diamonds in your country, you're never gonna get any of that money back, right? If you didn't get paid for it then, you're not gonna get paid for it later. So on the other hand, there are many that would argue that European imperialism in Africa led to a general economic improvement. They would point to, for example, the construction of infrastructure, railway, ports, roads, um, were in fact built throughout Africa or India, places like that. Public buildings, dams, and canals were all constructed. The problem was that the infrastructure, again, what little of it was built, mostly benefited the colonizers. Railways would run from gold mines to ports in many African countries, um, for example, and did not necessarily connect a lot of the major population centers or even run through hospitable areas that would be easy to populate, right? It was just about extracting resources from point A to point B and getting them back to the mother country. That's why you built the railroad. That's why you expanded the road or improved it, not to help the locals go visit their grandmother, you know, or increase ideas of nationalism by bringing the country together, like building railway in Europe. This was all about resource extraction. Now, granted, Africa lacked many of the giant population centers that had become 
common in Europe due to industrialization. So, you know, maybe that's why not as many of them were connected using these rails. But even when the opportunity was there, oftentimes that's not how rail or roads were, were constructed. The development of education is also looked at, you know, as you can see, one of these schools here kind of as one of the benefits of, of col colonialism, imperialism. Um, schools and churches were built to educate people, but it was never very many people. The educations were often rudimentary and prepared people for a little more than an easier time doing the same work they'd been doing for the colonizers. But nonetheless, some of the great African leaders of the 20th century would be educated in similar schools and in schools in Europe. Educations did provide those that could get them with better opportunities as local administrators, as well as literacy, right? And once you can read, you can teach yourself all the rest, right? But again, none of this education translated into political power, voting rights or citizenship for the vast majority. People were converted to religions that saw their native traditions and religions as dark and evil practices, basically witchcraft. Enrolling your children in these schools often came with the unspoken agreement to sacrifice your culture for colonial opportunity. Finally, the issue of global trade is championed as like one of the big benefits of colonialism. Um, that Africa was increasingly connected to the world's markets and that some African entrepreneurs and businesses were able to grow rich and benefit from those new global connections as they had during the slave trade. The disadvantage was that African resources and profits were mostly under the control of foreigners though, and not local companies and entrepreneurs, and that profits were being reinvested in Europe or in colonial militaries or in different, more profitable colonies elsewhere on the continent or in the world, not at the spot where those resources were extracted, right? So it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, All right, so to conclude this lecture, let's look at a couple specific instances of conquest in Africa. In 1652, South Africa was colonized by Dutch settlers known in Africa as the Boers. I'm never sure if I'm saying that right. Basically, the word means farmers in Dutch. They spoke the Dutch dialect of Afrikaans, right, which was a blend of Dutch with local African accents and vocabulary to create this this new dialect, Afrikaans. Um, the Boers, or the Dutch there, practiced a policy of white supremacy and lived segregated from black Africans. In fact, in racist tradition, Africans were seen by the Boers as inferior and frequently used as cheap labor and often enslaved. Their lands and cattle were taken by the Boers, often with little to no compensation, and then in 1871, Britain annexed the Boer colony, um, having established their own colony um, in the area in Cape Town around 1806. This annexation was not well received by the Dutch Boers and led to a series of conflicts known as the Boer Wars in 1880 to 1881 and in 1899 to 1902. The Britain and the Boers went to war over land and resources in South Africa, resources like diamonds and gold, especially diamonds. Um, Africans were used in these conflicts by the British, by the Dutch as well, in their war against the Boers. But there was no sense of unity, kind of as we've discussed before, right? Um, tribe was played against tribe by the British and other colonizers, and likewise, African leaders willingly enlisted European settlers in their, in their rivalries with each other to gain advantage, right? So there was Africans fighting on sort of both sides in this conflict. The Boer Wars, like the US Civil War, were seen as one of the conflicts that kind of foreshadowed the death toll and damage of the First World War, where modern weapons in the hands of disciplined national militaries would be used on a massive scale for the first time. So in the short run of the Boer Wars, 75,000 lives were lost, right? In just a couple years of sporadic fighting. Um, 
22,000 British soldiers, about 7,800 of them were battle casualties, the rest were from disease, six or 7,000 Boer commandos, 20 to 28,000 Boer civilians um, that were mostly women and children dying from diseases in racially segregated concentration camps. Uh, on top of all that, an estimated 20,000 black Africans who were allies of, of various groups of the Boers that died in their own separate or segregated concentration camps as a result of this conflict. So you've got a few of the kind of kind of evil seeds of the 20th century planted in that conflict with the use of modern weapons and concentration camps and racial segregation and things like that. These are some of the Boers in one of these tents at one of these concentration camps. Um, after Britain conquered South Africa from other European powers, though, the, the Dutch, they continued the racism of the Boers and the policy of apartheid, literally apartheid or apartness, um, was continued by the British as well, right? Where white and black races lived apart from one another. Um, South Africans were forced onto reservations, what I refer to as reservations, called homelands, or in Africa they were known as Bantu stands, like Afghanistan is the land of the Afghans, Afghanistan, right? These are the Bantu stands, the lands of the Bantu people, right? Even though not all these people are Bantu. Um, their homes and property were taken as they were forced onto these reservations or Bantu stands or homelands, almost always without compensation for that territory. And that issue of unfair compensation and historic theft or seizures is a current issue in South Africa. You can find newspaper articles on this ongoing issue right now. Um, where with the end of apartheid in the like 1990s, some of the black population is seeking to regain the lands that they see as stolen. And that's, that, you know, that's a whole bag of, of conflict going on right now in South Africa. Under apartheid, the white population, about 10% of the country, ruled over a 90% black and mixed ethnicity majority. Officially, apartheid is said to have been in place between 1984 and 1994, but segregation and, and kind of legal discrimination existed for much longer and has had dramatic effects on much of modern South Africa. These are all kind of signs from South Africa segregating the country between white and black. Um, officially, uh, segregation has ended, right? But as you can see in some of these um, photos, such as this last one here of modern South Africa, the, the generational effects of segregation can still be seen. You could find similar photos of the United States, I'm sure, where this black African neighborhood on the right is in stark contrast to the white African neighborhood on the left. Um, apartheid era infrastructure in cities were often constructed to give white neighborhoods easy access to central business districts and cities and keep black neighborhoods outside the city on the outskirts of town so that interaction between the groups would be minimal. These communities also you know, have an obvious disparity in the quality of housing, social status, and resources available to them. And this is, you know, in the modern day when all that stuff is supposedly ended, the effects remain, right, as we can see in our own country and history. Among the most important empire builders in Africa was the British businessman Cecil Rhodes, who's heavily involved in the South African, col South African colony, as well as some of the ones nearby. His De Beers company, which is still around today, helped create diamond mines in South Africa and soon accounted for 90% of the world's diamond production. Um, Cecil Rhodes gained new colonies for Britain in Southern Africa. His British South African company, the De Beers company, one of the many joint stock corporations on the front lines of imperial efforts, founded the colonial country of Rhodesia, a little bit like the East India Company in India. This 
corporation, this business enterprise of Cecil Rhodes was out there fighting wars and conquering and claiming stuff for Britain. Um, Rhodesia included the modern countries of Zimbabwe and Zambia. Uh, but Rhodes used his immense wealth to build railroads and telegraph lines in Africa, hoping to link the British domain in Africa from Cape Town in South Africa up to Cairo in Egypt, in North Africa, a feat that was never fully accomplished. Um, but in Cecil Rhodes, there's a great example of the union between sort of corporate and state interests throughout the era of imperialism. Um, also, he's a great in like, like kind of look or insight into the mindset of some imperialists and how their motivations could be far removed from simple profit and resources, um, but included those people obsessed with the glory of empire and the supremacy the racial supremacy of their people. A famous document known as the Confession of Faith shows Cecil Rhodes' empire, uh, Cecil Rhodes' motivations for empire, as well as his suspicious support for creating a secret society to rule from the shadows and work towards global white supremacy. I encourage you to take a minute to read through that document there to sort of pause the video and read through. There's some, some interesting stuff in there um, from from Cecil Rhodes about his ideas for the world. So finally, one of the most infamous examples of European colonialism is that of the Belgian Congo, the giant chunk of Central Africa colonized by the small country of Belgium. The Central African Congo region contains one of the world's largest rainforests and many valuable resources explored by guys like David Livingston and Henry Morgan Stanley. The first of these resources to be majorly pursued by Belgium was ivory, used for all kinds of products from toys to fake teeth, etc. You can see all kinds of ivory here. Rubber, which could be extracted from the Landolfia vines that grew in the Congo, uh, rainforest were, was the other super important resource that was extracted from this area. And the, the desire for rubber was driven by the industrial need for um, rubber for bicycle tires and automobile tires and conveyor belts and all these new mechanical devices being constructed in industrial Europe. Um, these are some people working with those Landolfia vines in the Congo rainforest trying to extract resources here. Africans would be rounded up and chained until their work was done. Um, colonized by Belgium as the Congo Free State during the 19th century and put under the direct control and command of King Leopold, all of the Congo as a private domain of Leopold, um, who had managed to convince other European powers at the Berlin Conference that he should be personally granted the land because his intentions were, you know, pure and humanitarian and philanthropic and, and he intended to Christianize and sort of uplift the area. Well, under the control of Belgium or, or Leopold, the use of terror and force was put in place to extract resources from Africans in the Congo, specifically rubber and ivory and then and later, like today, minerals. Towns and villages would be invaded by Leopold's 20,000 man force publique or the public force, the colonial troops of the region. And the men would be sent into the forest to extract a quota of rubber, while the women were held hostage oftentimes to frighten the men into meeting the rubber quota. When workers failed to meet the quota, they could be shot or mutilated, more often than not mutilated or both. To prove these deaths and that the bullets weren't wasted um, in hunting, you know, large game or things like that, the hands of the murdered would be cut off as evidence and used to sort of make up for um, not meeting the quota, right? You'd have to supply a certain amount of hands to show that you punished all those that didn't, that didn't meet the quota. Sometimes this meant People didn't even go and look for the rubber. They just went and got enough hands to make up for the rubber they didn't have, right? Um, when it's all said and done, during Leopold's time governing the Congo Free State or, or you know, the Belgian colony under his command, between eight and 10 million 
would die for murder, war, and forced labor. Many modern estimates say that that number, that 8 and 10 million number, was somewhere close to 50% of the population at the time. This is coming right after the end of the slave trade, not too long, you know, um, before this. Um, International attention fell on the Belgian king's atrocities in the Congo, and he was asked to relinquish control of the colony to the Belgian government, which he did after he made the Belgian government pay him for it, right? He became a billionaire off of the Congo Free State, both the resources he extracted from these people he worked to death or killed, um, and from the money he got from his own people who he had compensate him for the colony that he gave up. The Congo remains today one of the most war-torn and least developed regions in the world, let alone in Africa. Um, and if you, you know, if you click on the link there, it'll take you to a video that discusses some of that conflict there. But you can see all kinds of images from this time with missionaries and others um, that worked in Africa showing the mutilation that was widespread among these people. You know, it's not an exaggeration or something just in a history book. This was a very real and grim, dark reality of the Belgian Congo.